60 day All right. You guys ready to get started? Yeah. This next session is going to be absolutely awesome. We got uh, Dr. Jack Quazzo going to be speaking to us, and it is going to be really, really, oh boy. Dude. What do you, oh my this goodness. This is awesome. What in the world are you doing, dude? I'm going to need to get another wheelbarrow from the park and come out here and get some more stuff. <laughs> Cause they got all sorts of cool things here that you can learn. You Did bought you? all that stuff? Yeah, now I just need to like read it and stuff. And you've been reading it. some of that stuff? Well, kind of, sort of. You got I'm a hoping wheel maybe I can learn hand. lots of things. I got lots of cool stuff. Well, besides water, cause I was thirsty. But uh, just different fossils. We got the Caldwell tracks. We got all kinds of things. Actually, while you're up here talking, I don't want to listen to that. So I'm gonna be out there. Like buying stuff. Cool. And it's going to be pretty you neat. You know, actually, Dan, if you study that stuff, uh, you probably could, you know, travel around and speak on creation. Yeah. I don't know about that. Man, I don't think there's any way that could ever happen. Because, cause like, all the things you have to know, like, you know, where did Cain get his wife? You got to know the, the age of the earth. Uh, was there a worldwide flood? I mean, to be a good creation ministry, you got to know at least, like, six or seven things. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't, don't think that'll happen. You don't think you can handle but, that. But I did get to get one of these cool little T-Rex brains. Cool. Huh? From John Gusty from the Fossil Shop? Yeah, that funny looking guy out yeah. there with the table. Cool. Got T-Rex brains. What do those cost, you know? Uh, these these were, you know, I have no idea. He wasn't looking. I just kind of <laughs> took it. But We'll have none of that going on. We okay? got this one right here. This one's really cool. This is a special brain. It's a brain? Yeah, this is also a brain. <laughs> this is a Kent Hoven brain. <laughs> oh, really? How yeah. much did you pay? I bet you paid a pretty penny for that one, I didn't got $29.95. You, you right get Ken Hovind's brain for $29.95. Like yeah, $29.95. But that's not all. I got, I got this. Oh, this is this is a good deal, too. This what is, is Jack Cuazzo brain. That's, an, that's Jack Cuazzo's brain. This is good. This one was, uh, I believe, $42.50. More than 50, Ken right? Hovind's brain? Right out there. What? That was more than Kent Hovind's brain? Yeah, actually it was. Wow. But you know what? The most precious one, let me, I got it protected here. The most precious brain I have right here. Oh. I'm not going to let anybody play with this one. This, this is an Eric Hovind brain. <laughs> oh, it this is. This is really cool. This one was $5,000. Woo! Yeah! So, Five grand. So I'm going to keep now, that right there. Why is mine so expensive? Oh, what? Well, they said it's never been used. Oh. And so, and so I'm going to go shopping and stuff. All right, so without any further ado, Dr. Jack Cuazzo is an expert on, if you were here, you already know, he's definitely an expert. He's an expert on the Neanderthals and the cavemen and things like that. He is going to do a fabulous job presenting to us some incredible facts about them. Again, to arm us with the truth. We need to be armed with the truth, not just so that we can have it, but so that we can spread it, so that we can share it, okay? So let's give Dr. Cuazzo a hand as he comes up here to share with us some incredible stuff. Thank you, Doc. Am I on? Am You're I on. on. Thank You're you. good. Where, where'd that guy go with my brain, anyway? <laughs> I gotta show it to my wife. <laughs> Speaking of my wife, I never had her stand up for in this in this conference. So would you please stand up, Diane? <laughs> without her, without without her, none of this none of this fossil evidence could have ever been found or done. She carried the bags. She 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 loaded the pack, packed up for five kids we had, and we took them everywhere we went. Uh, all through Europe and uh, the Middle East, and it was just major expeditions whenever we went places and spent a month or so uh, looking for evidence, and she was the one who put it all together, and I just kind of went along and found this and found that and took x-rays, and that was that. But I want to talk to you this, this afternoon about ancient man and some of the discoveries that I have found. Can we lower those lights a little bit? Because you're not going to see. I've got some x-rays up there. You're not going to see the x-rays at all. But the questions about ancient man... First of all, who was he or who were they? Now, Jesus gave us the best definition that you can ever imagine. I never knew this, of course, in college. And I'll tell you a little bit about, more about this tomorrow and I'll give my, a bit of my testimony at the service. Uh, Jesus said, have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female? For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And that was our Lord's definition of who the original people were. They were a man and woman. Were they, were they real humans like us is the question. In other words, we have to know whether they were really human like us. Now, Adam and Eve sounded like they're real humans, but were they like us? 
Now, misinformation abounded in 1979, so my family and I embarked on a journey that would take us thousands of miles and 25 years to study ancient man. Now, here outside of Lazy Zay's France is what they want you to think, and this is on a, on a cliff in the Dordogne Valley, and Lazy Zay's is the prehistoric capital of France, and as I mentioned uh, earlier this morning, it's a real big business. Pre the prehistory business is quite a popular business, quite a lucrative business in southern France. This is a, a, a statue of a, a Cro-Magnon. It's like filet mignon, uh, but it's a Cro-Magnon in our language, uh, Cro-Magnon in theirs. And he's hun hunched over and he's stooped over and very ape-like. And this was the uh, portrayal that they would like you to have, at least in 79, and he might still be there now. I don't know. I don't think they've taken him down. It was a pretty big statue. But is this a true representation of ancient man? And the answer to that is no. And we have to overcome all these misrepresentations like this before we can know the truth. Because ancient man lived hundreds of years ago, so he or she couldn't have been exactly like us. And ancient man lived thousands of years ago. And as we know, Adam lived into his 900s, Noah lived 950, Shem lived 600. They couldn't have been exactly like us. You talk to cardiologists, you talk to my friends in the hospital, I'm on a staff of a hospital. You talk to any of our, my physician friends, and they'll tell you there's no heart that can go 600 years. I can tell you teeth won't go 600 years. And we know that for a fact that our, the, the, the uh, type of, of uh, mechanisms that we have going in our body today are good. They're fearfully and wonderfully made, but they're fallen. Uh, we're all decaying. And so we had, we had ancient teeth of, that were a better quality. We had ancient bones better quality. Obviously, ancient hearts were better quality. And these ancient people uh, were ancient quality. But how can we know anything about them? Now, the first thing we have to say is we take our Bible as a guidebook, and then we look at the fossil and artifact record in light of the Bible. Now, you're, you're hearing this from a scientist, a person who's looked at the fossils and uh, held them in his hand, held the fossils in his hand, the original fossils, the original bones, and I'm saying the Bible must be taken as a literal book uh, of, a, of, of a scientific nature, uh, where it touches on science, and of course it isn't a science book, but where it touches on science, as Dr. Francis Schaeffer would say, where it touches on science, it touches on truth. And then we look at the fossil artifact record through the lens of the Bible. Now how do we do that? Well, first of all, we can make Retrodictions. Now, retrodictions are predictions into the past, and science flourishes on predictions. I mean, you make a prediction, and you see if it comes true. I mean, they've done that with space. They've done it with, uh, with, uh, with chemistry and biology. I have a son who's a molecular biologist. They do this with, in molecular biology. You do it all, all over science. You make predictions based upon your hypotheses, and then you form theories and so forth, and you, by that way, you proceed along the scientific method. And the scientific method is, is based on making predictions. Well, we're making predictions into the past, and they're called retrodictions. Now, our retrodictions are based on biblical absolutes. Now, the biblical, ab ab excuse me, the biblical absolutes are high, the highest level and, and, uh, that we can go. We have absolutes that we know are absolute regardless. Uh, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Those are absolutes. Those things will never pass away. The, what I'm doing now, what we're doing now, creation research, it'll all pass away, but his words will never pass pass away. But we can make retrodictions based on those words, look back into science and see what we can find. And a retrodiction is prediction made into the past. We can make three. First, if people lived longer, children mature at later ages than we do today. Because if you lived uh, over 200 years or 300 years, you don't have a childhood of 12 years. I mean, that's obvious. And many scholars have said that. Humans had extended longevity, the Bible says that, the years before the flood and for a short time after the flood. That's a retrodiction that we can make based upon the absolutes of the Bible. Then, thirdly, and this is, I, I touch on this because my research accidentally bumped into this material while I was searching through the drawers in the back rooms of the museums. I actually bumped into stuff that would tell me that, hey, this earth is not that old. And I wasn't a geologist. I, I'm involved in human paleontology human anthro paleoanthropology, and I can make that retrodiction. Now, in human longevity, let's cover a few bases first before we get into the story of the Neanderthals. In the story of, in the area of paleoanthropology, that's the study of ancient man, evolutionary scientists have known for a long time that evidence for longevity, slow maturation, and slow growth were present amongst Neanderthal remains. I mean, they've known that. And it's obvious to me that they've known that because I've seen how they've tried to cover it up. Can we lower the lights a little bit more, too, because we're, we're not going to see those, the, the slides that well if, we get, uh, if, we gets, if it gets too bright. So I know that they know, you know, and I started to know that they knew right from almost day one when I, when I, what I saw when I saw. 
They did everything in their power to hide these facts from the public. It was too biblical. What made matters worse was some Bible-believing people back in the early days of this discovery of these Neanderthals that blamed Neanderthal form on disease. Now, the question we have to quickly cover, which won't take too long, is disease the cause of Neanderthal form? Because we have to erase that whole idea that Neanderthal facial and skeletal form have, have been attributed to pathological, which means disease, and nutritional uh, phenomena for years. This represents an attempt to classify them as non-evolutionary features, to put them on the shelf, and thereby close the issue. Now, there's lots of theories going around today that Neanderthals were caused by the, the basic configuration of the Neanderthal face, and their, their bones were caused by arthritis deformans, syphilis, and rickets. Those are the three things. Let's take them one at a time. Arthritis deformans, an old name for rheumatoid arthritis, really, really nasty disease. It has multiple causes, mainly affects the joints and the postcranial bones, everything from here down. With any kind of arthritis, very little bony change is seen in the head, except for arthritic changes one would expect to see in the joints, the TMJ, and a lot of us here have TMJ problems or had had them or people who, who know, know people who have them. And so that's something that we, we look for in Neanderthals. But here's the first arthritis I saw in a Neanderthal. And this is an arthritic change in the condyle, and it's right here where that white arrow is, and I'm putting the cursor on it right here. That's an arthritic change. That's a flat condyle because this is what a Neanderthal condyle looks like in its youth. That's the tip of the bone that comes up and goes into the head in the joint. That's a flat condyle, and that was found in La Chapelle aux Saints, which is a famous Neanderthal found in that cave of that name. And this bony protuberance is not flattened like this or eroded in this area. This is the only arthritis I saw in the head of this individual. There were many arthritic changes in his spine and other joints. But arthritis does not create Neanderthals from modern people who have this disease. And that's an important point. It doesn't create that. And this is, uh, this is a modern, uh, well, not modern, it's a Neanderthal condyle from Le Moustier 1. It's another, but a younger Neanderthal. So that's what it would look like. This is what it does look like. It's flattened out. Now, some of us flatten out our condyles pretty well if you grind our teeth. Uh, and some of us do grind our teeth at night. It's called bruxism. And you can grind and you can hear it if your children grind their teeth. And that also flattens out the condyle. But these Neanderthals flattened them out pretty well because they had these arthritic changes which took place in old age. Let's take rickets. The rickets problem is a problem with the calcification of the bone. It's a childhood disease usually manifest in the bones and caused by vitamin D deficiency. Lack of sunlight, UV light, malabsorption from the bowel, renal, because kidney excretion problems, all could be contributing factors. In adults, this condition is called osteomalacia, or soft bones, and occurs after the bones have formed. Proper calcification of the bones is inhibited. There is generalized demineralization of the skeleton. Now, that's not osteoporosis that many women suffer from. Osteoporosis is a disease where you have huge holes in your hip. I've seen x-rays of them in the hospital, and a hip looks like a piece of Swiss cheese that you just pick up in a supermarket. It's just an awful-looking thing, and I would recommend for, for women to take calcium uh, starting at a young age, and even older women, it still can do you some good. It's not osteoporosis. Now, childhood rickets displays the following skull pathology. You would see these things if you had childhood rickets in Neanderthal. And this has been attributed right up to this present day. There are books and articles out there that say Neanderthal had rickets, and that's the reason he looked like he did. First of all, number one, you have the presence of areas of thinning and softening of the skull. It's called craniotabes. Then you have a box-like skull. We're going to cover each one of these individually. Then you have base of the skull flattening. Then you have a high-arched palate, roof of the mouth. And then you have delayed eruption teeth and extensive decay. And then you have craniosynostosis, which is premature closure of the skull. So those things you would find, if, we, if, if, if I was going to see rickets in the museum and I was holding uh, cranium skulls in my hand, I would see these particular uh, pathologic factors. Now, here's an article I wrote on a, uh, something completely different. I wrote this for a, a German uh, museum book. This is a secular museum book. And hopefully it will be coming out in a month or two, and it's with all the major Neanderthal writers in the world. Now, I don't know why they included me in this book, but they, they did it because I was one of the ones who studied their skull with a special x-ray machine. So I guess they had to do it, and they're going to try, try and probably disprove my, my understanding and my uh, uh, basic uh, diagnosis of this skull. The calcification argument, though, has a good answer in this skull, because this is an x-ray right up here. This is an x-ray of a fragment of the head that I took with a dental x-ray, a big wide dental x-ray with the x-ray machine right on top of the, of the bone, and this is the bone down below. 
This is the bone down below right there. So you have the bone and you have the x-ray. And the calcification argument basically is, uh, <clears throat> this is part of the Neanderthal skull, Le Moustier, with the x-ray taken in Berlin, Germany. In an article written for this German museum, I had to prove there was no compression of this skull. This is a close-up x-ray taken with a two and a quarter by three inch dental x-ray directly under the cranial fragment, touching the undersurface. So you couldn't get any more one-to-one -one than that. I mean, it's a one-to-one -one image. <clears throat> the x-ray tube was only a few inches above the bone. Although the bones are fragmented and cracked from a bomb explosion that hit the museum in World War II, the bone texture is solid and the calcification is good and there is no rickets disease present. <clears throat> the sutures, the diploic channels, which are little channels in the bone, and the sinuses are present. <clears throat> I saw absolutely no rickets in this Neanderthal skull. Here are three skulls, one from Israel, Amud number one, which was found near Mount Carmel. This is uh, Le Moussier, France. This is the one I just showed you with the little piece, but this is now a larger piece of it. And this is La Ferrasi from France. Now, these are the box-like head argument says that these are shaped like a box. And as you can see right here, these are the most unbox-like cranium. There's no box-like heads and absolutely no rickets in these whatsoever. So the argument for rickets falls apart on two in two areas already. Calcification, we don't see any soft calcification and no box-like heads. Now, uh, we're looking at one of my patients here on the upper left-hand side, and that's a high roof of the mouth. Now, I worked on cleft palate patients for about 12 or 15 years at St. Barnabas Hospital in New Jersey, the regional cleft palate center, so I know high arched roof cleft palates, and I know high arched roofed mouths, and Neanderthals don't have it. And here's a Neanderthal called Peche de la Aze from France, got a flat palate all the way across, and that's just a break in the bone. And here's Gibraltar too from the island of Gibraltar, that's a Neanderthal child too, and that's half of the palate, and that's flat too. So we don't have high arched palates like my patient had here on the left. So everybody can see that. I don't know if anybody can see. Can you turn the lights down a little bit so we can see that high arch palate? Does that, does, if you can put your finger way up in there, way up in this point up in here, can you turn it down a little bit more so they can see that? That is a, that is a, right here, right in the center, right up there. And these kids cannot speak properly because they have a nasal quality to their voice and they can't breathe through their nose very well because the nasal, the nasal chamber is just the upper part of the, upper part of the mouth. It's right up over the roof of the mouth. And so that's, you just don't see that in Neanderthals. Narrow high arch palate compared to two Neanderthal flat palates. No rickets. There, there, there. No rickets. Okay, now let's go to the premature closure of sutures in the head argument. Now far from that, the Neanderthals had sutures that closed more slowly. And here, this is the frontal bone of a Neanderthal little child, and that suture is right down the middle of the head, and that's closing very, very slowly. And here's one, it's uh, called a partially open symphysis in the lower jaw, and that's closing very, very slowly also. So rather than having what we call craniosynostosis, we have a slowly closing bony connection in the head and lower jaw instead of premature closure. The total opposite of rickets. No rickets. Now, here are some loose teeth that I found in the drawer of the Engus skull at University of Liège in Belgium. And these teeth showed in a, in a tooth decay argument. Remember I said if you have rickets, you have a lot of tooth decay. No extensive decay. As a matter of fact, no decay in these children whatsoever. And down below here, you'll see the Gibraltar II x-ray right here. This is a Gibraltar skull found as a child, found on the island of Gibraltar, Neanderthal, famous Neanderthal. No decay there and no decay in these guys either. And I had these and I put them together on a piece of uh, tape and put them on a piece of uh, cloth and took a picture in. That's what we call normal occlusion right there, the teeth going together. So no decay, so no rickets there either. And all the primary molars, if I can just take a moment to tell you something about primary molars, these primary molars up here, these are the baby teeth. And these are baby teeth up here. These baby teeth are torodont teeth. Now we don't see those anymore in our children. If you're going to have a childhood of 35 years, if you're going to have a child who, who is mature, who's equal to our 12 years old, a 12-year-old when he's, say, 23, or is equal to our 17-year-old to, to our when he's 29, if you're going to have that kind of a child, he's going to have his baby teeth a long time. And if you're going to have baby teeth a long time, you're going to have to have a, what we call a torodont, bull-like baby tooth. And that's what you're looking at. You're looking at the Neanderthal or the early teeth that God first made for humans to have long, 
pro childhoods, prolonged childhoods. And this is the kind of tooth you would, you would need because this tooth is like a radial tire compared to the old-fashioned tires. It wears and wears and wears and wears. And underneath it, right here in the pulp chamber, here, this dark area, that's what happens. You get secondary dentin building up, and so it'll wear and wear and wear. Now, what about our molars today in our children, baby, baby teeth? Well, when they come out, you don't see the roots. But if you take an x-ray, if you look at your dentist's x-rays, you'll see they have high legs, big, high, long legs, long roots. And that tooth will only wear down until it gets to that point where the two, the two roots come together. It's called the bifurcation. And then it's over. That tooth will be exposed. So if, 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 if our children wore their teeth uh, into their 30s uh, or 40s um, and had a you know, pretty heavy diet like the Neanderthals did, we'd have a lot of pulp or nerve exposures. Now, we do occasionally see teeth in people. Uh, somebody might come to me today and say, I have a baby tooth that's lasted 35, 40 years. That's rare, very rare, but it isn't a torodont tooth because we just don't see them. We'll see torodont teeth in adults. We never see them in children. We never see them in children. So what happened was they got shut down somewhere along the line uh, and what Dr. Ball was talking about is that we probably have the potential there to build them again, and probably in the new heavens and the new earth, in the new age, when the lion eats straw like an ox, and people live to 100, and a, young, a youth will live to 100, thought to be cursed that died at 100, uh, then you see, you'll probably see the Torridon baby teeth again, because you're going to have long periods of childhood. Just imagine, the kids around the house for a long time. I mean, some mothers would like that, some, you know, wouldn't. The syphilis argument. Um, the syphilis argument, there's no signs of congenital syphilis. Uh, mulberry molars with little enamel, you don't have that. You don't have notched incisors. This is amyloid one. There's no notching in incisors. And there's no barrel shapes. No signs of late congenital syphilis. A major sign would be a high palatal arch. This is a flat arch on the mother of that Gibraltar child. That's about as flat as you can get on the mother of the Gibraltar child. So we just don't see the signs of arthritis, rickets, or syphilis. And I, I really thought that I had eliminated that with the book. But the more it pops up, the more I get to the point where I'm thinking about, I don't know if people listen anymore, because I thought, and, and even Colin Groves, who, who reviewed my book for the, for the talk origins, and, and, you know, and, and is a skeptic about everything I say, even he said, well, it looks like Dr. Claus eliminated those arguments. Well, they persist in uh, creation. They persist in the creation of science. Now, let's take a look at what some of the anthropologists did to actually change the evidence so we couldn't make biblical rec retradictions. We got rid of the diseases now. This is called evolution after death. When I, the first child I picked up was the Peshta Aze child. And uh, those of you who read my book will, will understand that the teeth, uh, when they were placed into occlusion by the first man, when the teeth were put together by the first man, a Dr. Pat, E. Pat, in 1958, he put them together wrong. And when I got to the laboratory in France, I put them together in what we call normal occlusion. And here you can see that here. And there they are up there in that, in that position. The teeth are, are, are in normal occlusion. And the jaw goes in the condyle that I showed you before, the arthritic one and the non-arthritic one. Well, this is a child's condyle. This goes into the socket perfectly and fits just exactly really well right in there. And so what you have is you've got the, you got the condyle fitting in the socket, you've got the teeth in normal occlusion, and this was not uh, an opportunity to, to make the Neanderthal child look like an ape. It was, this child had more of a retreated or smaller face. Now, if you're going to make a biblical retradiction, and this is what we're going to do in a minute, we're going to show you how this comes about, you would say that children, ancient times, grew slowly, had torodont teeth who could last a long time into late childhood, say they lost their baby teeth when they were 25, 26, 27, 29, um, they also had small faces, so the faces would grow and grow and grow over that whole period of time. So if you picked up a Neanderthal child that looked about two and a half, and we don't know exactly how old he, he was, I've got some predictions that I, I make in the book, you would expect them to have a very tiny face. Well, that's exactly what they didn't want you to see. They didn't want you to see the tiny face, and so they gave you this face, this one right here down the lower right-hand side with the big protrusion and the jaws sticking out like an ape. The other thing about apes is they mature twice as fast as humans. 1.8 it is, exactly. So they mature, they mature very fast, and they grow very fast. So if you make them look like an ape, you're going to have a child of prehistory that's got an ape-like growth pattern because he's closer to the apes. But if we got a child who's closer to Adam, he's going to have a slow growth pattern, and that's evidence that the Bible is accurate. Okay? I mean, remember Sarah? She was 90 years old, all right? And, and, and who? A king wanted to take her into harem, right? Because what? She was very beautiful, all right? Go to any nursing home around here, anywhere. <laughs> I invite you. 
and see. And in all due respect for 90-year-olds, I just don't know one that a, that a king would want to take into a harem at 90. What does that mean? That means that Sarah looked a lot less than 90. And that's what I'm telling you. These kids looked a lot less than what they really were. So what we're saying is we had a slow-growing child, and they had small faces, and that's the whole point. So the teeth were in maximum contact, and we got, and I was scared to death when I took this. I'll take because my son John said, Dad, we're going to change everything. I said, we're going to change everything, and we better run. And we had to run. Those of you who read the book, you find out that they tried to steal our x-rays back. They tried to get back because I gave them a set, and that was, you know, that was part of the deal. Give them a set of x-rays so they can have what I did. And I handed in my set, and the Dr. Copans had gone on vacation, so he was gone, but I gave it to the secretary, so she didn't know much about it. But I guess when he came back or somebody else saw them, oh, boy, everything broke loose. And we got followed and chased and so forth. And those of you who read the book, you know what happened. We barely got out. We got out of the country. I, I got these x-rays out of the country inside of comic books, inside of a, a French comic books. Now, here's, here's Le Moustier, supposedly 16 and a half years old. His jaw was 30 millimeters out of the socket when I saw him in the, in the slide that they sold at the museum, 30 millimeters out of the socket, right here. So this jaw was 30 millimeters out of the socket, the upper jaw was 30 millimeters forward, and that made it look about as ape-like as you can possibly imagine. And that's what they wanted. They wanted to portray an ape. And so in, the, in any dental office, this would be a dislocated jaw. Now, I was a dentist in the Navy on the Enterprise, on the aircraft carrier Enterprise. We had a lot of guys come on with broken jaws and with, from fights. And, but I never saw anybody come out, come on the ship uh, or into my dental clinic on the ship with a jaw out 30, uh, 30 millimeters out of the socket. That, that's extremely painful. That's the x-ray composite. This is what Le Moustier really should look like. If you could see this, perhaps you could see it over on this side. It's the, that, that's the composite by me taking all the x-rays of all the pieces and putting, toge putting them together on paper. Putting them together on paper. And that's what my German article is about. And that's what the German article is trying to show. Because that's a baseline. That's a Neanderthal baseline of a teenager who's probably 29. Now, it doesn't make any lot of sense, I know. But that's the way it was. He was probably 29 or 30. University of Liège, the skull that grew after death. Now, here's the real problem. SPI-1, that looks like SPI, is an adult Neanderthal from Belgium. Its cranial length is 216. I don't have a picture of it, but just take my word for it. It's 216 millimeters. Angus 2, which I do have a picture and I'll show you, is a four and a half year old child, supposedly, from Belgium. Its real cranial length is 164. This is 76% of SPI-1, when it should be at least 86%. Remember what I said, that these skulls are small. They're small for the ages that they give. Well, they realize that. So I go to Belgium, and I measure the skull in um, 81, something like that, 82. And uh, a PhD candidate comes over from the University of Pennsylvania, Nancy Minu Purvis, and, and she gets her PhD, and she writes uh, that uh, Angus II is not 164, it's 176. She adds 12 millimeters to it. And it was, uh, became 81% now of the adult, and that's an acceptable range. So now we can't deal with this little small skull, because that's too biblical. That means in order to get to be a big skull, it's going to have to have the world's fastest growth rate, faster than apes, or a long time. And that's the problem, a long time. And everything that they see that requires a long period of time, they change. I absolutely guarantee you that, because that would demolish the fossil uh, record of coming from apes. Because th don't forget now, apes are twice as fast as us, so we came from chimpanzees, so we, we start very fast developing, very fast developing, very fast, slower, 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 slower to us. Okay? That's their side of the story. Our side of the story is we're slow developing, we live 900 years, our kids get their baby teeth and they keep them until their 30s, maybe 40s and 50s, maybe back early when people were living 900 years. When they were living 300 years, they kept them until they're 29, 30. And then gradually, the teeth were lost earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier until today in my office today, I see girls at 10 and a half having their first menstrual period and, 10 and, and at nine going through pubertal changes and parents are complaining that girls are getting old too quick and boys' voices are changing early and you can not and you can see it happening in front of your eyes. I can see it happening in front of my eyes. I can see kids developing quicker and quicker and quicker, and everybody's wondering what's going on, and that's exactly what's going on. But here's a time and, and, and place in history when we can document that. So they didn't like that. 
They didn't like it at all. And so what they did was, Nancy did, she did she, there's a ruler laying right on, right on the, the bottom surface of this skull. If I can get this cursor up here properly, here it is. There's a ruler. Now, from here to here is 164 exactly, I'm sorry, uh, 79.5 millimeters. From here to here, the, the two whites on this side is 164. She made it go out to the black line right there, 176, clear outside the skull. I mean, clearly way outside the skull. So what we're talking about is, if you can see it, you can't see it on either one. And that's the problem. Could you lower those lights so you can really see these lines? Because this is really important. The black line is outside the skull on both of these. Can you lower them really down? Can you get the, the big bright ones? Is that possible? No, it's impossible. All right, well, take my word for it. She increased it to 176. 12 millimeters in length was the increase in order to avoid embarrassment of a small skull. Now, when I was in the lab, the Musée de l'Homme in Paris, 1979, a human paleontologist cut the chin off the lower jaw of Laquina number five, and that was a skull that was excavated in 1911. When it came out of the ground, it had a chin. You can see the arrow pointing to the chin right there on your left. That's the first cover for Buried Alive. We have a second cover for Buried Alive now. And they changed this, and they put it on the back cover of this picture. Um, and much to my uh, consternation, they made it much smaller when it's a major point. But again, you lose a lot of control when the a book company has uh, you know, the authority to do what they want to do. So this um, was contested by Colin Groves in the review. He said, that's plaster. Well, if that was plaster holding the teeth in, there's no plaster around those teeth. That's chin. And that guy was cutting it off while I was there. And the reason he cut the chin off was because apes don't have chins and he wanted to make it look more ape-like. Now, that's not fair. And I've been to a lot of churches with a lot of audiences, and I've told it to a lot of people, and very few people believe me. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. They, well, if somebody raised their hand and said, you know, if I did that in my, job, my business, I'd lose my job. I said, well, exactly. But they don't. They don't lose their job. They get points for doing this. And in 1979, this is what, what it looked like. As a matter of fact, he brought it over to me, and it was hot dental compound. He had taken all the teeth off, and you never do that. You never take all the teeth. You take all the teeth off and you cut down the bone on the lower jaw. You cut all the bone out and you put hot dental compound. Now, I, my dad was a dentist and I worked in his office when I was 12 years old. And I worked with hot dental compound and I made little funny animals and I did everything with it. And I, you know, I know hot dental compound. So when he brought it over to me, I knew exactly what it was. And he said, I, he just molded this around and it was in the shape of an ape. And the original jaw shape was not that. The original jaw shape was not ape-like. And what he did was he, he shaped it like an ape. All right, so uh, I said, well, the, what do you want me to do? He said, well, you're an orthodontist. What does it look like? I said, well, you know, it looks okay. It looks ape-like. And he said, uh, I said, can I take a picture of it? He said, sure. So I got that picture. Right now, he didn't know it's going to appear before creation audiences. Uh, but, but that's what it is. That's what they do. I mean, Paul said, what do they do? They suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Right? And why did we get in trouble? Why did we get chased? There's why we got chased right there. If you want to know why the French, uh, whatever they were, CIA or whatever, tried to, tried to knock us off, that's why they tried to do it. Because of that. And I, I, these things went into a police station when I got home from France. They went into a police station. I had a Christian policeman friend. Now, can we still make retrodictions based upon this, this evidence? Uh, yes, if you put them together right, you can still make retrodictions if the corrections are made. So we're starting out with the first retrodiction, children matured at later ages, we do today. All right, we used the skull. I told you about that. You've already seen it, so I won't spend too much time on it. But at the little tiny skull, an Angus Belgium skull, really shows the smallness, the size of the head, and the fact that it grows slow. And in order to get to be a big skull, it's got to grow at world's records, which they will not admit, and it has to be a long time. Okay. Second, this is really important, because this is really crucial. The little child from France that we were supposed to be, I put the jaw in a normal position, they had it way out ape-like, has this, some lines going through the head. Now, the lines going through the head, specifically, are a line going through, we call this the Frankfurt horizontal. It goes from the ear to the, to the eye, ear to the eye plane. It's that red line right there. And then this one just is a parallel line down below it. And what I did was I drew it. This is the original x-ray that I took in the, in the French Museum. And it goes through the tracing right here of this skull. And so the palette is in green right there. This, this is the hard palette, the actual palatal angulation. If you looked at yourself from the side and you looked at the palette in an x-ray, you would see this green right here. And ours doesn't angulate like that, but this is what you would see. Okay, so now what we'll do, it shows a very, very small face, and the angulation of the palate is minus 14 degrees to that red line. Our modern two-year-old male palatal angulations is zero. 
there is the green coming up over on the right side, and that shows you the, the angle of the palette. The green on the left side shows you the same thing, the angle of the palette. And what this turns out to be is a very, very angulated, um, tipped up, fetal position. So here's a child that's born. He may be two, he may be more. I think he's more. And he's got a fetal position of his upper jaw. Because when our kids are born, their upper jaws are flat. They're flat down. The jaw comes down like this. It descends and descends in the womb and descends and descends until the jaws are flat. They come straight out like this. So what makes that possible is the fact that the back of the lower jaw where this arrow is back here, right there, that arrow right there, that arrow is pointing to the part of the lower jaw that is the vertical part. That's called the ramus. That's back here right below the condyle, it's the one that goes right by the angle of your jaw and goes straight up. Now that is four standard deviations below normal for two-year-olds. Four standard deviations below normal. Nobody in this world has that anymore unless they're birth defective, but this is a normal child. So this is a normal child with four standard deviations below the norm in his lower jaw measurement. Which, and he has a palate that's retruded. Now, if I were looking for perfect design for a slow-growing child as an orthodontist, this is exactly what I would do. I would make that part small, and I'd tip the upper jaw way back, and I'd make that face grow out like a clock, because the face is, the clock of the head is the, is the face, and I'd make that face grow out slowly, slowly from under the head. What makes all kids cute is that they have small faces. And all the adults, they, well, adults, they say they get uglier as they get like, older. That's because our faces get big. That's what happens. Our face gets large, and our head, our, our head size stays about, stays about the same. But the face grows out from under the cranium and grows forward like a clock, and that's the slow thing that God did in the beginning for these kids. Four standard deviations. So he's got a facial retrusion, not a protrusion, quite opposite the ape-like business. Now, here's exactly what it is. Here's the immature position of the fossil. Here's a 10-week-old embryo with a minus 20. Here's a modern one-year-old with a zero-degree angulation. The green is the Frankfurt horizontal. The palatal plane is red. And here in the minus 10-week-old, or rather the 10-week-old fetus, right, it's minus 20. We know our little Pesh de Oz is in the minus 14 range, 13, 14, 15. And we're zero when we're one year old. So something is different about these kids. They're very immature. They're very slow growing. Very slow growing. And that's the last thing that they wanted us to find out. Pesh to Oz, the 14 year, uh, minus 14 degree palate, and its maturity is equal to somewhere between a modern one year old and a 10 to 12 year old week old fetus. Fetus. And it seems strange, but that's the way the ancient people grew. Minus 20. Okay, little Neanderthal child has a more retruded face. And this is based on national studies done from Bolton from the Cleveland study. This little child has a face that's further back than a one-year-old. Okay, so how far back is his face? That this is a three-year-old, this is a two, this is a one. This is the little Neanderthal child way back there. So, you know, here we have, and look at his jaw, is way back here. This is perfect. So we would make a retrodiction saying he'd have a small face, a small jaw, a slow-growing jaw. He'd have a tipped, tipped palate. He'd have all these things that denote a slow, slow-developing child, and he does. He does. Therefore, the Neanderthal child was fetal-like in his facial development, except that he had teeth. And that's strange. This is a whole new field of study. And science would benefit if it, if it, if it stopped preventing uh, the, the, because there's a lot more Neanderthal children that can be x-rayed, to stop preventing this kind of research that will lead you towards the, the Bible and the mind of God rather than take you away. Science would benefit from this. We will have answers to why our kids have progeria today. Well, what's progeria? What's premature aging of children? What's the pre what about premature, <coughs> premature uh, uh, development of girls? Why is puberty being lowered by pediatricians and not, they're not really caring? Just say, oh, just lower the puberty age now. Or just give them some, some adrenal cortical steroid hormones. Why is that? Well, because, because something is happening to human beings and we're getting earlier, earlier, earlier maturation. And it's not good news for an orthodontist either because we like to see kids when they're growing, not when they stop growing. 
And so if a child comes in and they're already stopped growing, uh, we're working on a little, a, a little child who's actually like an adult. Now, adult orthodontics is not a problem, except quite often with adults we have to do surgery. We have to do surgery because we just don't have enough, enough uh, growth potential. They'll grow slowly, as I'll show you in a, little, in a while. So there were approximately, between the little Peshtaia's child and this Lemoussier, about 26 to 28 years between these two Neanderthals. Loss of baby teeth late. Second retrodiction. Humans had extended longevity in the years before the flood and for a short time after the flood. Now there's a universal notion, Herdlitschka said, that when the adult stage of life has been reached, all growth except in bulkiness has been accomplished and henceforth ceases. The very definition of an adult is that of a person grown to full size and strength. The purpose of this paper is to show that while such a concept suffices in general, scientifically speaking, the view is largely erroneous. Now, Alice Herdlitschka was the chairman of the Smithsonian Anthropology Department back in the 1930s, and he said the head keeps growing our whole life. Now, bone is dynamic. People tend to think of their bone as rigid, inert material that holds up their bodies, but bone is far more dynamic than that. It continually dissolves and reforms. Indeed, adults replace their skeletons every 10 years. So you replace your skeleton every 10 years. Bone is like skin. You're continually and constantly remodeling it, says Susan Greenspan, University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. What would happen to our face and head if we lived 500 years? Now, what we did, my son-in-law, who's now a professor at Baylor Engineering, while he was a student at University of Texas getting his PhD in bioengineering, what I asked him to do was to write a computer program based upon studies from the University of Michigan on people who went back to school at Michigan, older people who went back for serial x-rays year after year until they were in their 80s. What happens to the head as we get older? That's the big question. What happens to the head as we get older? So I said to Brian, write a program to find out, because we already knew what would happen as, as they get to 80, the head gets larger. And I mean, any of you can, can find this out. If you're past 50 years old and you had a hat that fit you when you were uh, 20 years old, it won't fit anymore. And we have less hair. And it's the same with me, it's the same with anybody. There's no person that defies that argument. A, head, a hat will not fit you when you're 50 if you had one when it fit you when you're 20 because your head's continually growing. And so if we grew to 500, what would we look like? So Brian did the computer program, and this is what we, I presented to the ICC conference uh, back in 98 in uh, Geneva College. This type of a growth pattern is something that we would see. We would see the brow ridge growing forward. This is 100, and this is 500. We see the eye socket move forward. We see the upper jaw move down. We would see the uh, lower jaw at 100, 200, 300, 500 square out in the back. And believe it or not, the chin would start to disappear because the teeth move forward over the chin. So all these changes take place over 500 years. So what do you think Noah looked like at, say, 500? Now, we don't know if he, if he moved as fast as this because this is a modern rate but Noah would look pretty grotesque. Noah would look like a Neanderthal. Recently, Dr. D. James Kennedy, in a sermon, said the same thing. He said, because I had gone down, done some programs, uh, uh, programs for him, and he was convinced, and many, as many people are, many orthodontists are convinced this is true, and, and, and medical groups that I've spoken to, that if we did live 500 years, we would look pretty funny. We would look pretty funny. Here's a living example. This is a lieutenant in the Navy during World War II, age 26 years old. Take a look how his hat fits. He was a pilot in the Navy in, the, uh, in, in, in World War II in the Pacific. Here he is with the same hat on, just a different cover. You know, you can change those covers from white to tan. Same hat on at age 83 years old. Same hat. The officer's cap fits perfectly at age 26, but at age 83, it sits on top of his head. Now, my officer's cap when I was on the Enterprise sits on top of my head. I could have never gone on the quarter deck and said, requesting permission to come on board, sir, because they would have laughed at me. Like, Who is this guy with a hat sitting on top of his head? But that's what it looks like today. And my hat has not changed size, but my head has gotten bigger. My brain, I don't know what's happening to the brain. Some days I wonder. But I mean, that's what it looks like. Take a good look at this guy, because you're all going to look like this. Look at your grandparents when they were married. Look at your grandparents when they're older. Look at, did you ever go to a class reunion? You can't recognize anybody after 30 years. Or you can look at them, but you say, well, I remember you, oh, sure, you know, oh, sure. Uh, yeah, you kind of look like, it's not the face that's changing, it's the bones that are changing. 
What you don't realize is that your bones in your face and your long bones, everything's changing. Nose gets longer, bad news, the nose gets longer, ears gets longer. I mean, a lot of things happen, but, but the facial bones change. And eventually you get to look like a Neanderthal. Since this is true <coughs> of our heads today, try to imagine what an ancient man must have looked like after he lived for more than 250 years, and that's what he looked like. La Chapelle of Saints of Saints lived 250 to 300 years, and that's what he looked like right there. You can see that. You can see it better over on this side, but that's what he looked like. The big brow ridge sticking out on top, the, the fact that his head receded way back in the back, his chin had started to disappear. He lost a lot of teeth. He had the arthritis in the condyle. His cheeks came forward. His nose came forward. He had a nose probably like Pinocchio. I mean, really. Look at the slope in that nose. Look at this slope. That's really amazing. This nose would come straight out like this. I mean, so you imagine Noah at 950 with his nose sticking out like that? Now, we don't know how fast it grew, but we have an artificial idea of what these people look like. It's not true. If you're human beings and you grow old, and they were human beings and they did grow old, we don't know the rate, of course, they had to look pretty funny. Well, any of you think of them living 500 years, remember that. This is 250 to 300 years of age. I know this comes as a shock to some of you, but this time the people started to accept this because it's real. Now, what are conclusions concerning Neanderthal growth and development? Well, we start out with Peshta'a's up here, he's very small. Then we go to uh, the three of them, the three of them are, are uh, superimposed there. We go to Le Moussier, 29 to 32, La Chapelle, between 250 and 300. Now, what I had done is I've sent these x-rays to Rocky Mountain Orthodontic um, um, Diagnosis Corporation in California in um, because we do this a lot with our surgery patients. Our surgery patients who require an absolute accurate diagnosis is whether we do orthodontics, just straight braces, or surgery of moving the upper or lower jaw. We have to know pretty specifically what we're doing in there. And even though I trace the x-rays, I don't trust my own tracings. I will, I will check with the uh, Rocky Mountain Corporation when they have computers do this. And the computers did my Neanderthals, and they didn't charge me for them because they had never seen anything like it before. And so what they did was they did all Neanderthals, and they came out with the same results that I came out with that these guys really, really grew very, very large and had very, very strange heads and had all the configurations of an old person. The expert in this country, Dr. Rolf Barents, who's now at the University of, of, of uh, he was at University of Tennessee, he's now at the University of Texas uh, Dental School in, uh, in Baylor, I'm sorry, Baylor in, um, in uh, I'm not sure what the city is, but he's Baylor University orthodontic chairman. I laid all these out for him on the table, these x-rays one day, and I said, Dr. Barents, ape or age? Ape or age? And he said, age, Jack. And this is the expert in the country. He said, age, Jack. He said, you can tell anybody I said it. I said, okay. So Neanderthal growth is slower and the development um, was slower. And they call them Neanderthals only because the first one was found in the Neander Valley in Germany in 1856, <laughs> named after the hymn writer Joachim Neander. But this is what an old person would look like from the ancient days. Third retrodiction, and this I'll have to do pretty quickly, is the entire history of mankind is a much shorter period of time than believed by evolutionists, and I came on this material kind of accidentally, not the first one, of course. This is Robert Boyle, the father of chemistry. This is what he said, and this is his book, a book I have, written in 1648. He said, and Christ to convince the world of their unableness to emerge and recover out of that deep abyss, whereupon the load of sin, which in scripture is called a weight, had precipitated fallen man, came not into the world until well nigh 4,000 years of sickness had made the disease desperate and the cure almost hopeless. So Robert Boyle, the father of chemistry, who, by the way, couldn't get a job today in a chemistry department because of his position on creation, believed that Jesus Christ was born around 4,000 years after the creation of the earth. And since there were 1,648 years from the time Jesus was born to when Boyle wrote this, he would be qualified as a young earth creationist, Robert Boyle. Neanderthal population statistics. There just aren't enough Neanderthals to cover the, the 400,000 years, 200 to 400,000 years. More than 10,000 generations of Neanderthals should have lived. The total individuals that we have are 500 to 600 and only 12 complete skeletons. And I'll tell you how they count. If they find two teeth, that could be two people, even though it could be from two sides of the same jaw. And that's not fair, and they're not supposed to do that. But I've been through, and if you look in my book, I, looked at one of the, I went through a number of, 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 uh, of fossils from different discoveries, and it was able to, to, to condense it down to only a few people when they had 21 or 30 people, 25, or 8, 9, 10 people. It had teeth in there. You couldn't tell if they were from one side of the arch or, or they, probably from the same person on, on both sides of the arch. But you find two jaws, you know that's two people, or two, two heads, but not when you find teeth and not when you find finger bones and things like that. There's only 12 complete skeletons. That is not a lot. 
Could be up to 700 by today. It's still not a lot. This is not, isn't this strange for people that buried their dead? Now, they buried their dead. All Neanderthals did. Homo erectus did not bury their dead, by the way. Conclusion, this makes the time less than 200 to 400,000 years. This I came across in Germany in a, in a museum. This is a spear, a wooden spear, perfectly preserved for 400,000 years. Wood. So Neanderthal spears discovered in a mine in Schoenigen, Germany in 1977. Wooden spears for 400,000 years. Please. I mean, the wood on my house is not that old. You know, it's 20 years old. And it, just, it needs a paint job. And, and the paint in the caves is supposed to be 20,000, 15, 20,000 years old. It's not even peeling in some of these French caves. I'd like to get paint like they had. So they had some technology. I'd like to have paint from those caves on my house. And wood like the spear if it's 400,000. It can't be 400,000. But what I'm saying is everything is exaggerated. Exaggerated. Now, here's some of the, to go along with what some of Dennis's material, this is the picture that you'll see on Buried Alive. You'll see it, um, you'll see it on my website. You'll see it on uh, Genesis Park. You'll see it on a number of websites have this. This is the dinosaur and the mammoth carving that we saw in the cave in France of the dinosaur on the left side and the mammoth on the right side when they're never supposed to have existed together. These two creatures came together in a battle one time, and this, whoever uh, drew this, the confrontation, I call it, um, was in the cave called Bernafel, and it was a closed cave, because all caves are open, and when you find a cave that's closed, you know something's in there they don't want you to see, and so we went in, and the door was split open, and we didn't split it, somebody had split it open before us. There were some people in the cave with a little dog, and my whole family went in, and we went in this dark and, 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 and drippy and, and muddy cave, and it, they could have been using it as, as part of their prehistoric uh, um, uh, amusement uh, park, so to speak. I mean, it could have been used as a tourist uh, as a tourist um, attraction. One other quick thing we'll talk about is red ochre burials. And I do want to say that red ochre is a powder that they've put on uh, people, and our morticians still use rouge on, on people who are dead to make them look more alive. And they, even the ancient people did that. And they used a powder called red ochre. It was red hematite, or iron hematite powder. And they would pour it on the, on the bones, or they'd rub it in the skin, and when the flesh rotted, it would actually seep its way into the bones itself. And so you would see the red ochre in the bones. And so they have found this from Mesopotamian culture from around 5,000 to 3,000 years ago through Jericho. Now, these dates, of course, are surely way off. They found it there. They found it in Grimaldi. They found it in Dol Dolce Vestinici, Dolny Vestinici in, in Czechoslovakia. I saw it in Pesht Oz, and I saw it in Swanscombe. Now, that's almost 400,000 years of one burial culture, and we know that's, almost, that's impossible. That's impossible. Let me show you. And the reason I, I say this is a real trick is another trick. It's like the white eyes of the ape that I showed you this morning. The red stuff was on the inside of the skull. And that's, of course, it would go in there if you had it painted all over the child's face or, or, or powdered all over the child's face. It would go inside the skull. And here it is, where those arrows are, that's where the red spots were. And this is red ochre between the roots of a teeth, of a Neanderthal, between the roots of his teeth. And that's red ochre. Um, it's in La Farassi. It's been washed off the outside. I mean scrubbed. You don't see it on the outside of the Neanderthal skulls. So the pictures you see in National Geographic and Time and all the books that are published, you won't see red ochre. And there's a very good reason, because they scrubbed it off. I saw the school skull, S-K-H-U-L, from Mount Carmel and Harvard. And I was in Harvard. I was in Stephen Jay Gould. I had a key to Stephen Jay Gould's lab for a week when he wasn't there. And I, had, I was going through all his bones and everything. And I'm looking for red ochre. And it's all washed off the outside. And the inside, there's, there's red ochre. So somebody knows that red ochre burials can't go 400,000 years or can't go 300,000. I mean, what burial custom can go that long? So I started to put two and two together. I'd go back and think about it at night, and my kids, of course, would come to me and say, Dad, this is impossible. Nobody can bury people with red ochre for that long and go from the Middle East all the way to Europe over that many, that, that many years. That's, that's just an absolute, an absolute uh, uh, ridiculous presupposition, proposition. So red ochre has been washed off and uh, not on the inside of the skulls. Now, if science was allowed to be unbiased, it would support the Bible. That's my contention. And I can tell you for a fact, after 25 years of going in these museums, in the Field Museum in Chicago, which I have not done a whole lot with my material in the Field Museum, I went through all, as I said to you this morning, the paleontology fossils, the, the, the Paleocene epic fossils from the tertiary period. I have lots of that material. I have Homo erectus. I have lots of material. I have never seen anything contradict the Bible. And I mean, I have tried. I have tried to contradict it. I have tried to see something wrong. 
I have never, and you can put, that, put me down for that quote, I have never seen anything uh, uh, contradict anything I've read in the scriptures in the, in the world of human paleontology. Thank you very much.